It is Thursday, April 15th. We got a big, big show for you. It's a little bit of a, a conspiracy story. Um, and, and, and I'm going to be honest, if you really listen to all of this, and then if you go to framingpaterno.com with John Ziegler, you're going to find out there's a lot more to the Jerry Sandusky story than you might think. All we've been told is what the media told us, right? Granted, it's an older story. People have already made up their minds. But I would challenge you to try to listen to what John Ziegler has to say. Listen to the interviews. Listen to all the details around this case because after doing it and spending about 30 hours kind of going through his research, I will tell you this. I'm skeptical that Jerry Sandusky ever committed sexual abuse. I'm skeptical because I don't trust the media. I don't trust the system. I don't trust any of it because of the stuff that has went on over the last 5, 10, 15 years. So anyways, we're going to get to this. I want to I want to detail first before we move on. Comment below if you think Jerry Sandusky committed sexual abuse. Not was he a weird guy, not was he a bad guy, but did he commit a crime? Did he sexually abuse young children? That's what I want to know. Yes or no, simple question. Comment down below. Now, I want to outline some of the players that John's going to talk about because I, I'll be honest, I didn't know all of them. I mean, everyone knows Joe Paterno, the, the, the famed head coach, I mean, legend in state college and nationally at Penn State, and he is a legend cover-up of sexual abuse of Jerry Sandusky. Everyone knows Jerry Sandusky, this monster, child abuser, sexual molester, right? And we're going to find out if he's maybe just a weird guy and an, and an old guy at this point. And then the guys that I didn't really know, the first and foremost, what this case resided on entirely was Mike McQuery, the ginger football coach who walked in and saw Jerry Sandusky sexually abusing a kid, did nothing, told the cop, didn't tell the cops, didn't do anything. And his story has changed 17 times. He ended up getting paid off $12.3 million. So he became a millionaire because he saw this sexual abuse, right? He's a big key player in this. Gary Schultz, the former vice president of Penn State, who was who oversaw campus police, played a major role in all of this. Spent two months in jail for it. So you need to know who he is. Alan Myers is the kid from the shower that Mike McQuarrie saw. He also is a, a guy now, a man that saw Joe Pater saw Jerry Sandusky as a father figure his entire life until the attorney Andrew Shubin. The civil attorney who conjured up all these victims to go after Penn State civilly and win millions and millions and millions of dollars. So I challenge you to listen and think outside the box and say, eh, could there be more to this? Could this be a media witch hunt for Jerry Sandusky? Could this be a civil lawyer who wanted to make a ton of money? Could this be a farce? That's the question. Comment below if you think this is... This really happened. Did Jerry Sandusky commit sexual assault? At the end of this video, at the end of this video, at the end of this episode, I bet you think a little differently. But enough about that. Let's get the Zach, boy, you have nailed so many of the important aspects of this case better than any interviewer I've done uh, an interview with in 10 years. And, and you're even bringing some things up that, that I haven't fully uh, expressed publicly, but I'm so glad you just did that. When you listen to the Gary Schultz interview, and we have two different interviews of almost four hours in total length done over a several year period of time. The only interviews he has ever done. These interviews should be on national television in prime time. Right. Unfortunately, they were with me and one of them is with me and Liz Habib, my co-host for this podcast. Uh, and we're posting them now for free at framingpaterno.com. The, the, these interviews are so amazing, but what you just said is a point that should not be lost. Gary Schultz really does expose the nature of the investigators' MO, their tactics, and how desperate they were, how intimidating they were, how completely invested in a narrative they were. When he was first told, that the allegation that Mike brought was of sexual nature, Gary Schultz was completely blown away. And this was 10 years after McQuarrie had come to him and the athletic director, Tim Curley, to, to, to tell them what he had seen or what he actually had heard. People don't realize that. Most of McQuarrie's testimony is about what he heard, not about what he saw. But the idea that somehow this was a sexual event was completely out of the realm of even possibility for Gary Schultz. And they were not just hinting in that direction. They were being graphic and, and, and basically making it seem to Gary like 
you have lost your mind because you're not remembering that Mike McCrory told you that he saw a rape of a boy. Right. And, 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 well, that, and the, Gary, language, the language is what grabbed me in the interview when they say, when they said, so you didn't know Jerry Sandusky shoved his penis in the anus of a 10 year old boy. I was like, my God, did you have to say it that way? Like, and, but, and by but the way, and by the way, Mike McQuarrie himself, this is not a hyperbole exaggeration or anything. Mike McQuarrie himself says he did not see that. He's it's, it's, it's his testimony. Well. I, and, and so, so, um, so your point on, on, on the tactics used by the, the investigators and the prosecution is outstanding, but let's be clear, despite that, despite his, his life being destroyed over the last 10 years, despite going to prison, despite, I mean, this was a guy who was retired. He was going to live the good life. He had, he had a children's center named for him, Gary Schultz did. This, his, he, he, had, he had won the lottery of life. And all of that comes crashing down because of this allegation against Jerry Sandusky. And in my interviews with Jer Gary Schultz, Gary Schultz says, John, I'm paraphrasing, I can come to no other conclusion than that Jerry Sandusky is innocent. Mm. And this is the last guy on the planet that would have an incentive to say that. One, he knows he's going to get mocked. Two, his life has been destroyed because of Jerry Sandusky's stupidity of, of occasionally showering with, with young boys who he thought of himself as their father figure for. Uh, and yet Gary Schultz knows the facts and is willing for the record, because he knows this isn't going to change the world, speaking to me on a podcast. It's not the nature of the world anymore. The truth doesn't matter. But he is he's willing, he's willing for the record to, to put it out there and say, I have no reason to believe Jerry is guilty. The evidence indicates to me this happened on December 29, 2000. I don't believe Mike McQuarrie saw a sexual assault. And from what I've seen from the accusers, they are not credible, especially without the backing of Mike McQuarrie. Remember, this is all connected. The, the only reason why we don't even, 99.5% of the public knows none of the names of the Sandusky accusers because right. they got no scrutiny. And the reason is because we didn't need scrutiny. We had Mike McQuarrie. Yeah, Mike, Mike McQuarrie. McQuarrie Mike Mike McQuarrie proved the case, so we don't need to get into the ickiness of of child sex abuse allegations. And we all know no one lies about this stuff, even when they're getting paid tens of millions of dollars. And let's be clear: of the people who testified, the people who testified against Jerry Zadusky at trial, um, eat, every single one of them ended up getting paid multiple millions, one of them got paid up to $20 million because of their testimony in this case. I'm sorry, that impacts people's perceptions of what? reality. Do you think? I, it's just, oh, I, I've, I've lived it and seen it. That's where kind of where my mind goes when I heard the, the, the interviews. I was like, man, these prosecutors are really trying to get their narrative hammered into all these witnesses so that their case can, you know, be, be stronger, right? That strengthens their case. If they hammer in these, these key graphic details, then, then, you know, the witnesses start to turn. It's like you said, the Loch Ness Monster. So my next question is following up on Gary Schultz is it just so that people can maybe get a refresher or they might have no idea. Who is Gary Schultz and what relevance is he to this whole this whole case, this whole situation? Gary Schultz was a vice president of administration at Penn State. He, he oversaw a lot of different aspects of the university. In fact, uh, ironically, although it's, it's more than ironically because it, it played a role in, in a lot of the way this story went down, one of the departments that he oversaw was the campus police. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you'll love this. You'll love this story about McQuarrie, by the way, Zach. Yep. So, so McQuarrie is very sensitive about the idea that he didn't go to police, right? right. He's very sensitive about this because he, and, and so he has concocted this idea that he thought that when he went to go talk to Gary Schultz, oh, that he was talking to the police. Oh, now, conveniently. Well, well, no, it's it's way worse than that. This is this gets good. This is good. This is good. So when he gets asked, okay, so why did you think of Gary Schultz as the police? Right? Uh, he says it's because I remembered there being a riot on campus, 
And I saw Gary Schultz on a walkie talkie and it looked like he was he was giving orders or, you know, or organizing the response to the riot. By the way, probably true. Probably true. Certainly. Except there's a problem that nobody in this case figured out. The date of the riot is after his meeting with Gary Schultz uh, about, about <laughs> Jerry Sandusky. You know what? So, 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 so he, like a lot of Mike's story, he is reverse engineering. Reverse engineering is a, is an important phrase in this entire story. Mike has a result he needs to get to. I need an explanation for why I didn't get to the, go to the police. And then why did I go to Joe Paterno? So he concocts this narrative that he thought Gary Schultz was the police. Now, but Gary Schultz was an incredibly important figure here because Gary Schultz in the context of this case, and I have to tell you, Zach, and I've told Gary this, I never bought the full cover-up theory. It never made any sense because of the, what we've already talked about from, from the right. beginning here. But I always had some suspicion about Gary Schultz because there was this infamous secret Sandusky file. And I thought, okay, that's weird. I mean, why would there be a secret Sandusky file? And, and some of the things that Schultz was alleged to have done didn't make a lot of sense to me. And I thought, I, I remember, I even remember telling Franco Harris, and by the way, one of our, my favorite interviews in this is Hall of Famer legend Franco Harris talking about confronting Mike McQuarrie at Joe Paterno's funeral Ooh. and in great detail explaining why he comes away convinced Mike McQuarrie didn't see a sexual assault. And this is Franco Harris at Joe Paterno's funeral. I mean, right. I, 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 I have, I have related this to like uh, if you're, if if Wonder Woman ensnares you in her uh, in her uh, truth telling rope, uh, you're, you're Mike McQuarrie. You're not lying to Franco at Ooh. Joe Paterno's at, at Joe Paterno's funeral, right? I'll tell you so, this much: if if you don't have the balls to break up a sexual assault, you don't have the balls to lie to Franco Harris's face. That's for sure. Right. Exactly. But um, <laughs> but but anyway, um, with with regard to um, to to. Frank Franco and and Gary Schultz. Boy, I lost my train of thought. Um, what, what the hell? Where was I going with that? Um, with uh, so we're talking about Gary Schultz and. Do you remember what I, what I was saying about? Well, I, I had asked you the who you know what is Gary Schultz's role in this? The Sandusky secret file that did, didn't didn't make sense. The cover up didn't make. Oh, sense. okay, yeah, 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 yeah. So I even told Franco Harris. That, you know, if there's one person I'm concerned about, because Franco and I have become very close in all this, it was Gary Schultz. Well, once I got to know Gary and once I've interviewed him for four hours, uh, I, I no longer had any concerns about Gary Schultz at all. And that secret file is actually like everything in this case. It's the opposite of the media narrative. That file, there was nothing nefarious about it. And in th the reality is the prosecution found out about it because Gary Schultz turned it over to them. Now, so, had it. so, so, I mean, it just doesn't, it, the mind boggles as to what you have to believe this, this was the worst cover up in the history of cover ups. All, all the prosecution information comes from Gary Schultz. And oh, by the way, for those who might be thinking, but John, what about those awful emails between the administrators, including Gary Schultz and Graham Spanier and Tim Curley, about how they're going to handle the Jerry Sandusky allegation by Mike McQuarrie. And, and my uh, response to this always is, um, if you're going to do a cover-up, and these are smart, esteemed people who have been very experienced in life, the, the, these, this is not their first rodeo. Uh, I mean, this is a, these are huge jobs. The president of the Penn State, athletic director at Penn State, vice president of administration at Penn State. Um, do you think you're going to concoct a cover-up of child sex abuse on state owned email servers yeah you'd have i mean the the level of of idiot of, of idiot you would have to be to do that that's there that's just impossible it's not it's not absurd. even it's absurd it, it's on not its even face. worth talking about there's no way that i mean maybe one guy maybe one guy's dumb enough but you're talking about a collection of high level executives at a place like penn state are all that dumb that they're going to email on their university e no come on man that's that's ridiculous so um, I want to go back to to kind of as we were talking about it, you mentioned it and we haven't talked about it yet. Talk to me about, first of all, who was the boy in the shower? 
boy in the shower was named Alan Myers. Alan and Myers. So what does Alan Myers say about that day? Does, does well, he have anything to say? That's a great question that for some reason, nobody in the media uh, wants to talk about. Well, so, uh, so here, here's what we know about Alan Myers uh, post the McQuarrie episode, by the way, uh, he was effectively 13 years old at the time. He was, uh, and I think this is important as a football coach. I think you'll you'll um, you'll find this significant. Alan Myers on the date of December 29, 2000, is uh, two and a half years away from winning a varsity letter on his high school football team. So he's not a little boy, okay? Right. And he's an athlete. Uh, and he's he is somebody who has no father figure. Uh, Jerry Sandusky, uh, like he did with a lot of kids from his second mile charity, becomes very close to Alan Myers because he, he wants to fill, fill that role as the father figure. Uh, Jerry referred to him as family. So Alan is spending a lot of time uh, with Jerry Sandusky at this time. So post that event, Penn State uh, asks Jerry about this. And Jerry says, you can talk to Alan Myers uh, Jerry says, Alan, is that okay? Alan's not real thrilled about it, but he's fine. Okay, yeah, if you need, Penn State needs me to talk to him, fine, nothing happens. So after that, the following things occur with this alleged uh, rape victim. This boy was anally raped in the shower at Penn State. By the way, he's heterosexual. He's married with kids. So you tell me, Zach, if this makes any damn sense at all. So post this event, uh, Alan, uh, when he becomes a high school football player, because he has no dad, uh, at his senior night, you know, obviously you bring your, your, your dad out on senior night, right? Uh, yep. who uh, plays the role of Al Myers dad on, uh, uh, on a senior night. Gotta be Jerry Sandusky, right? Jerry Sandusky. Of course. Uh, Alan Myers, uh, actually uh, asks his school whether or not he can invite a guest to speak at his high school graduation on behalf of the entire school. Uh, guess who that person was? Jerry Sandusky. <laughs> Jerry Sandusky. Uh, Alan Myers, uh, coaches, <laughs> coaches a flag football team with, uh, I believe it was like eight or nine year old boys, um, you know, which if he's a, an abuse victim, awfully weird that he is coaching with Jerry Sandusky, the, the uh, team picture of which was in the local paper, Alan Myers and Jerry Sandusky coaching this flag football team uh, of potential Sandusky victims, I guess, if you were raped uh, um, uh, by Jerry Sandusky, uh, Alan Myers, um, then gets into Penn State because of Jerry Sandusky. Guess who he lives with? Well, he's going to Penn State. He lives with the Sandusky, Sandusky family. He lives with the Sandusky family while going to Penn State. He then goes into the Marines. And when he's in the Marines, where he eventually becomes a sergeant in the Marine Corps, Jerry Sandusky's mother dies. Alan Myers drives at least 10 and a half hours each way from his Marine barracks to attend the funeral of Jerry Sandusky's mother. Then Alan Myers gets married. Alan Myers gets married. And who does he invite to his wedding? That's right. Jerry Sandusky, along with Dottie Sandusky, and takes a photograph of him in his Marine uniform, arm in arm with Jerry Sandusky at his wedding. Then, when Jerry Snusky gets accused of child sex abuse and the, uh, the reality of the grand jury investigation becomes public, guess what Alan Myers does? Alan Myers writes a letter to the editor that appears in two local papers, I have the clippings, talking about how Jerry Sandusky is the greatest thing that ever happened to him, that the accusers of Jerry Sandusky are not to be believed, uh, and, uh, and, and detailing a lot of the things I just told you about that Jerry Sandusky had done in his life. In his own name, uh, in local newspapers, this is before the crap hits the fan. Then the crap hits the fan, and Jerry Sandusky gets arrested. The media firestorm begins in November of 2011, Alan Myers comes forward to Jerry Sandusky's defense attorney without Jerry or his defense attorney even knowing. He brings his mother with him. Again, he's a sergeant in the Marine Corps at this time. He he's brings a badass his, is what you're telling me. Right. He brings his mother, who was a huge fan of Jerry Sandusky at the time, in to give a statement to Jerry Sandusky's defense investigator, an FBI-trained former police officer. He gives a blockbuster 
like three page statement with all sorts of details, including the detail that he had done a police interview two months earlier where he ended the interview because they were investigating Sandusky. He entered the inter- ended the interview saying, I think you're trying to get me to lie about Jerry Sandusky. I will never say anything bad about Jerry Sandusky. This interview is over. And he wow. leaves. Wow. Th- this, is, this statement is given... On November 9th, 2011, that night, Joe Paterno is fired. Graham Spanier, the president of the university, is fired. The whole world changes. The whole world and every every criminal or every civil uh, litigator in the state knows that Penn State is on the hook for well over $100 million. And there's an amazing coincidence that ends up causing a perfect storm of circumstances, just one piece of this never-ending perfect storm. And that is that Alan Meyer's mother, who I told you about, used to work for a local attorney in State College by the name of Andrew Shubin. And Andrew Shubin is on the hunt for Sandusky accusers because he sees the handwriting on the wall. And guess who becomes a Sandusky accuser, thanks to the role of Andrew Shubin, but Alan Myers. And Alan Myers ends up getting paid about $8 million because of his role in this case, even though he did not testify at Jerry Sandusky's trial. It is my strong opinion, having seen, I've been to Alan Myers' house, (laughs) having known his story probably better than anybody in the world, having seen him eventually testify at a a defense appeal hearing several years ago, that what really happened was that he and Shubin made a deal, that uh, Shubin knew the value of of Myers' story being the boy in the shower, Myers maybe even being somewhat convinced that maybe Jerry was a pedophile, he just never abused me, Uh, but he didn't want to have the blood of Jerry's conviction on his hands. He was going to wait and see what happened. And if Jerry got convicted, you know what? Then we can come forward and collect my money. And that's exactly what happened. This was one of the more mind-blowing lack of curiosity moments by the news media, and there have been many. So the trial happens, Jerry Sandusky gets convicted, and then almost immediately... So-called victim two, the boy in the shower's lawyers come forward and say, hey, we've got the boy in the shower. My immediate thought, and I at this point, I already had a sense of who the boy in the shower was, but I didn't know any of the details. I'm immediately going, whoa, whoa, whoa. Why didn't he testify? Right. Where was he a month ago? <laughs> right, right, right. It was literally a, less than a month, I think. So oh. why did he not testify? Nobody in the media wants to ask this question. Why did he not testify? Well, my, um, I'm, I'm simple-minded at times, but my deduction from all that, as I listen to you, is that, like you said, maybe he thought Sandusky was a child molester. He just didn't molest me. And two, if he's already going to prison, why not get a couple million, right? After the fact, like the damage is done, I didn't do it necessarily. So let me just get a couple million. I think that that's a very strong possibility is what happened with Alan Myers. He rationalizes it in his brain that, hey, look, I don't know if Jerry's guilty. He never did anything to me. Maybe I misinterpreted. You got to remember, this is where the media is so powerful. The, you know, he, Alan Myers is becoming is bombarded, oh. bombarded with messages that his best buddy, his father figure is a child molester. There's a chance that at least part of him is going to start thinking, oh, my God, did I did I miss this? How yeah. did I miss? Oh boy, I was lucky. And- I got I dodged the bullet. But but even under the best case scenario, he's thinking exactly what you just said. You know what? Uh, it's a shame Jerry's going to prison, but nothing I can do about it now. I might as well get my eight million dollars, right? And so, and and so that's exactly what happens. And he gets paid without any testimony, and he gets ref. He gets <laughs> at trial, Zach. The prosecution actually tells the jury because I'm sure you know they were probably thinking, is it possible that someone on the jury is going to wonder why the hell? We don't have a boy in the shower from the McQuarrie episode because that is a rational question that people might ask. I mean, if you're a juror, you might be wondering, wait a minute, this case has gotten worldwide publicity and you can't find the boy in the shower? Right. That's not possible. So the prosecution comes up with this doozy. They actually tell the jury in closing, 
the identity of the boy in the shower is known only to God. That's a direct quote from the prosecutor. Known only to God. As, which, in a, in a normal case, I could see, all right, I guess that's possible that, that the, the boy in the shower just didn't hear about Jerry Sandusky being arrested. He didn't hear that all this is going on. And, you know, in a normal case, there's not $8 million on the table for your testimony. But in this case, nobody in Pennsylvania hasn't heard about this. Literally nobody. nobody. I, I, and, and, and by the way, let's say he moved away. There's no place he could have moved to the, no. you know, in those you know, just 10 years later, because we know he's in his early 20s based on the timeline. Yeah, uh, only, the only, only way the guy didn't know about it is if he's dead, right? At right. that point. The as, only as, way, exactly right. The only way he doesn't know about it is if he's dead. And the only, and there's no reason why he wouldn't come forward because one, he wants justice for his rape. And two, he's going to get paid millions of dollars. Right. So, so it is a preposterous notion that they sold that somehow, you know what? And what's worse about it, Zach, it's not just that it was a preposterous notion. They knew who Alan Myers was, but mm. they were afraid of his story. And that's why they didn't call him to testify. Yeah. But unfortunately, both sides were afraid because the defense got spooked when he went to go become an accuser on, under the wing of, of Andrew Shubin, who was representing all these other accusers. And so the defense doesn't know what the hell he's going to say. In my view, it was a huge mistake by the defense. If I'm, if I'm the defense, I call Alan Myers and I say, let's pack a lunch. Let, let's, let's delve into this oh. and, you're, and how you become uh, a, a, an accuser of Jerry Sandusky. But unfortunately, Jerry's defense uh, was, was pathetic and Joe yeah. Mandola was way overwhelmed. Uh, right. as his defense attorney. There was no dream team here because Jerry Sandusky didn't think he needed a dream team. OJ gets the dream team because he's guilty as hell. Uh, J Jerry Sandusky right. decides to go with his buddy Joe Amendola because he doesn't have any money. He doesn't think he needs a dream team because he knows well, he's innocent. I mean, it's, in, in, in it, to his credit, now I, that's that's a pretty big allegation. I think I'd try to st still assemble a dream team, but I've, I, I've never been where Jerry Sandusky's been, but I've been in a courtroom before and had to go to a trial, a jury trial, and I knew the truth was on my side, so I didn't really care. And, and, and I, I, I can kind of relate to that. Like, if you know you didn't do anything wrong and you have the truth on your side and you're naive to the process of a jury trial, which I was, he probably was, you just think, there's no way I'm going to get in trouble for this. I didn't do it, right? So what does it Zach, matter? Zach, I'll go one further than that. And that point you just made is another outstanding one. But, but Jerry Sandusky is not just naive. Uh, he's a guy who up until this point, life had been exceedingly good to. He had lived his dream. He had lived right. his dream. He never dreamed he would be a national championship winning defensive coordinator at Penn State, his alma mater, have this massive charity. Yeah, I mean, he, 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 the system had been so good to him. He was beloved and yeah. he's also very religious. Yeah. And I think religion... Play. There's one thing that people have no clue about because they haven't lived my experience on this. Religion plays a role in this case in many ways. And one of them is that Jerry and Dottie Sandusky being very religious, very Christian, they believed that God was going to take care of them. Yeah. And they also, by the way, believed this is another part of the perfect storm, especially at first. Jerry is handcuffed in fighting back, not just by the media firestorm and the fact that Joe Paterno gets fired. By the way, once your legendary coach gets fired, you have no credibility. Uh, you're presumed guilty. The, the disastrous Bob Costas interview happens. No one's giving you any benefit of the doubt. But it's even worse in this case, Zach, because Jerry, being so naive, still loves these guys who are testifying against them. He is convinced they won't be able to actually testify in court. He thinks there's no way, there's no way these guys who I was his father figure to are going to be able to do this to me. And so that naivete is on steroids. I mean, Joe Mandola told me that just a couple of weeks before the trial started, Jerry actually says to him, well, can't I just talk to these guys and figure out what's going on? And Joe's like, 
Jerry, you have no idea what is happening here. The mm -hmm. whole world, the whole world, oh, naive to levels that you cannot possibly understand. I actually think that in a very big picture way, the you know part of why the media loved this story was that it happens in Happy Valley, Pennsylvania, Penn State. The Paterno era was supposed to be you know the bastion of character and goodness, and above all the the corruption in college football. I actually believe that's part of what made them vulnerable to the downfall. Right. I, I, I relate it to animals in a zoo that have completely lost their survival instincts. Right. These people, the Happy Valley is this this perfect place, not perfect, but I mean, you know where I'm going, yeah. where, where these things don't happen. And we, we, we don't have to deal with this on a daily basis. You know, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> there are other football programs, you know, your Miamis and Florida States and, uh, and, uh, and other places like that, uh, where these people are battling every day, fighting to make sure they don't get caught. Yeah, so, right. so, so they're, they're not animals in a zoo. They're animal with survival instincts. Penn right. State, the people there had no survival instincts at all. Right. And as soon as this allegation comes down, they all curl into this fetal position of, oh, my God, I can't believe this happened. Well, what if it didn't happen? You right. morons. Why right. are you throwing your best people under the bus? And we've seen this happen so much in in politics and in the social realm in, in recent years virtue signaling so Ooh. much of this is Ooh. about virtue signaling the penn state community needed to virtue signal immediately that oh my gosh we had nothing to do with this we hate jerry sandusky we hate pedophilia and by the way we're going to show the world how much we hate pedophilia by convicting this guy's ass with no with no actual evidence and nice. and that's what happened uh, and and it's the most it's the most obvious by the way zach this case isn't even close that's what's so amazing i mean people people for 10 years have been calling me insane i i haven't believed jerry was innocent for all those 10 years probably about seven of those years but people have been calling me insane for all this time uh with only you know a few in, uh, growing exceptions to that including people like malcolm gladwell and gary schultz and franco harris um but um i'm not the insane one here the insane ones are the people who looked at this case and didn't ask any questions, bought into a, a completely preposterous media narrative from the beginning, and now don't have the courage to revisit it. When the, the lives of five good men, in fact, you could argue great men, were destroyed over a perfect storm of events where the bad guys won. Mm. Uh, th this whole case, I, I relate it to, it's kind of like um, the, the negative of a photograph where white is black and black is white. The white hats here are being worn by the bad guys. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the black hats are being worn by the good guys in the media narrative. Everything is upside down. The whole world got flipped on its head once Joe Paterno gets fired. And by the way, the Paterno family is part of this problem. The Paterno family is, in, is invested, largely because of his son, Scott, is invested in Jerry Sandusky's guilt. Because if Jerry Sandusky is innocent, then Scott Paterno is the biggest fucking moron in the history of the planet, which, by the way, he might be. <laughs> what did Scott do? Well, Scott was the one who was advising Jer Joe Paterno during all of this. And Scott, who never even had a conversation with Jerry Sandusky, he didn't know Jerry Sandusky from Jerry Glanville. All right. <laughs> but 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 Scott Paterno thinks of himself as this brilliant political operator. He's a lawyer, a, a, a lobby. By the way, another part of the perfect storm. He's a lobbyist for Republicans in Harrisburg. Well, it's a Republican gubernatorial administration that's bringing these charges. They've got him by the balls. Yeah, he right. can't go against this. So he, Scott buys into Jerry's guilt immediately mm. uh, based upon nothing more than rumors. And once he buys in, his whole strategy with Joe, his dad, was, Dad, we got to throw Jerry under the bus as far and as fast as we can. We need to separate ourselves from Jerry Sandusky. I get why that was his instinct. And in a, in a rational world, that might have worked for Joe Paterno, regardless of Jerry Sandusky's guilt. But in this, we're not living in 
this we're not living in Kansas in this case. Mm -hmm. This case breaks all the rules because of the level of media attention and the hysteria and the panic in, involved in all this. But Scott Paterno declares Jerry Sandusky effectively guilty on the evening of November 8th, 2011, on the front yard of Joe Paterno's house, where he, in front of cameras and a cheering crowd, uh, says that we need to pray for the victims because a lot of boys were damaged here. And uh, at that point, all of Penn State Nation, including the Penn State Board of Trustees, has just realized, oh, well, obviously Jerry's guilty because why the hell would Joe Paterno, speaking through his son, Scott, declare Jerry to be guilty? Right. And, and by the way, I believe that's partially why Joe gets fired the next day, because the number one thing the Board of Trustees has to worry about in firing Joe Paterno is they can't fire Joe if they're not certain Jerry's guilty. Right. right. So, right. So, so Scott effectively eliminates any concern about Jerry's guilt, thus paving the way the next night for Joe to be fired. That's how Good stupid Lord. Scott is. And um, and Scott and I have battled now for. Uh, about nine years, we hate each other's guts. It's one of the more entertaining. It's one of the more entertaining elements of the podcast. Uh, I'm sure he'll, if he, unless he, unless his mother has him muzzled, I'm sure he'll be saying negative things about the podcast. He's accused me of all sorts of things that are not true. In fact, his accusations against me, Zach, because I knew them to not just be untrue but to be laughable, is part of how I concluded that he had no idea what the hell he was talking about in the case. Because yeah. I'm like, if he's if he believes this shit about me, which I know to be true, then he's clearly believing other. It's easy for him to believe other stuff that's not true. Right, certainly. And, and and Joe, I mean, you know, Joe's dying statement was uh, apparently widely reported. Just find out what the truth was. And Scott has not lived up to that. I would argue I'm probably the only person in in, in this realm that has lived up to that. Uh, yeah. um, and I, I know I never even met the guy, uh, but I think he lived a life that was, uh, deserving of that. And, and, you know, I know, you know, people who did know him very well. I mean, Urban Meyer, uh, obviously, uh, was a, was a big admirer of Joe Paterno's. And I think it's very telling that people like Urban Meyer to this day, Steve Spurrier, uh, other people like that never say an ill word about Joe Paterno. And by the way, Mike McQuarrie never got another job. Uh, right. that, well, that to me, I would, that's, and I'll tell you this, you know, my, my grandfather was, you know, one of the finest men I've ever been around in 37 years. And I'm not just saying that because he was my grandfather, but he was a longtime football coach, uh, you know, during Joe Paterno's heyday, right? Like when Joe Paterno was really, you know, not the, the legend that was kind of on the, the, the back quarter of his career, you're talking the, the Joe Paterno, right in his prime. And they were really, really good friends. And my grandfather was on the radio when all this started to happen. And he had to get pulled off the radio because he would, I mean, vehemently defend Joe Paterno and talk about how everyone is idiots. This is a great man. This, this is untrue. Would never happen. They had to pull him off the radio because wow. he wouldn't shut up about it because well, he was, he, he was going to defend to the end because he knew he was a great person and it wasn't possible. Well, your grandfather was clearly a very smart guy and, and kudos to him. And, and by the way, just to finish off the Ohio State aspect of this story, does anybody really believe that Urban Meyer would have stuck by Greg Schiano after after all of that went down where allegedly Mike McQuarrie had implicated Greg Schiano and then he loses out on the Tennessee head football coaching job because of, of a bogus story. I mean, let, let's be, I'm going to be very clear about this. The Greg Schiano story actually ex further exposes what a fraud Mike McQuarrie is, as well yeah. as the media. Uh, Mike McQuarrie, here's what happened with Greg Schiano. This is how absurd it is. Greg Schiano and Mike McQuarrie, to our knowledge, have never had a conversation. They never coached together. Okay. Right. Mike McQuarrie didn't know Greg. Okay. The, the, the story that Mike McQuarrie tells in a civil deposition of a case where Mike McQuarrie ends up getting paid millions of dollars eventually because he's he's a whistleblower. Mike McQuarrie, who thinks this is never going to be public, concocts this story that Tom Bradley, who was the event the defensive coordinator at Penn State, was told by Greg Schiano that Greg Schiano had witnessed Jerry doing something with a boy. Now, first of all, that's triple hearsay, right? I mean, right. That, that, right. It's, it, 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 
because Tom Bradley has vehemently denied that that ever happened. And I happen to know people who know Tom Bradley well, who believe that Tom Bradley still thinks Jerry Sandusky is innocent, or at least has no reason to believe that he's guilty. By the way, Tom Bradley and Mike McQuarrie lived with each other for a while. So, mm. so, they, so, so Mike McQuarrie is willing to throw Greg Schiano under the bus, his former roommate under the bus, on a story that's totally made up simply to try to concoct this narrative so that he's not the only one at Penn State that, that, that was a witness to this. That, to me, illustrates who Mike McQuarrie really is as much as anything in this whole story, as well as what a fraud the narrative is. And again, if it was real, would Greg Schiano be coaching right now? No. Well, I mean, right, come on. And it, I'll tell you this. Was, I know Greg Schiano very, very, very well. And there's no that he had ever saw anything or could have possibly heard a rumor that Sandusky was doing things like this or any inkling to, of the sort without acting because he's that type of person. I mean, you talk about a quality human being. Um, he, he there, It's just not possible. I mean, and I, and I, know the, I know the guy as well as you can know someone. I mean, he, he, was, he was integral in, in my career and in, in my personal life even. Uh, and, and it's just not possible. Well, I, I do, we could talk about this forever and, and I want to make sure people, you know, they, cause I've spent now, you know, six hours on it just this week and I'm not going to stop. I'm going to listen to every episode. I'm going to listen to every interview on framingpaterno.com. Um, so the first episode, when this la launches, it's out Thursday, which is, which is today, right. As, as we release this, um, what is the, the timeline for, for how often is an episode coming out? What are, I have a feeling people will be wanting more quite frequently. <laughs> well, um, yeah, as of now, we've got the first episode out on iTunes and Spotify and you can, as well as 17 hours plus of raw interviews, which really, you know, is maybe the most remarkable part of this whole thing. You can find all of that at framingpaterno.com and then, our plan is week to week, probably each Thursday, we'll release another one of our 19 episodes. So this will go on for, you know, almost uh, the, into the almost to the anniversary of this story, uh, which is in November of, right. of 2011. And um, and let's be clear. I mean, this is incredibly extensive and it's not to me, Zach. I wouldn't be still involved in this story. I've tried many times to quit this story. Many times this has been, you know, I, I, this has been a terror. This has been the, one of the worst things that ever happened in my life. Um, but I would not be involved in this 10 years later if this was just about Joe Paterno or Jerry Sandusky or even Penn State football, which I don't no. really care, care that much about. This is, it is a, a, an incredible story about how our news media is totally broken yep. about how the truth no longer matters. And the real story of this uh, saga to me is both fascinating and enlightening to how humanity really works in the modern era. Uh, and, and I've even told people, uh, you know, I feel like my work on this case has given me a crystal ball in, in figuring out the everything else about what's going on in the world. Uh, mm -hmm. I've had people come. To, I've had come, people come to me proactively and said, "Oh my God, John, I never fully understood what you're talking about with what happened at Penn State until the whole COVID thing hit." Right now, I, I I see incredible parallels to the way the media narrative cannot be fixed. It cannot be changed once people are invested. Uh, it doesn't matter what reality is. It doesn't matter what the facts are. Uh, because no one wants to admit they were wrong, and there there are other similarities as well. So this, you're in for a ride the likes of which you've never experienced before. I'm fully aware that we are uh, hitting our head against a brick wall. Um, but I hope at the very least, some people will be able to learn some things uh, and, and that the truth still matters to enough people to where uh, we can get some traction here. And at least the historical record of this travesty uh, will be out there for people to know. Well, you know what? You can't trust the system. You trust the media, but at least the record is being set straight if people want to know it, right? At least if people want to know the truth, they'll be able to find it here, right? That's one of my goals. And there's no question that this is a full record. This is as full a record as you're going to get. Now, I mean, you know, are there die I's I'd like to dot and T's I'd like to cross? Sure, there's, there's still a few things left out there but i mean this is this is an unprecedented effort unprecedented and it's 
it's absolutely amazing that uh, Liz Habib, who's a, as I said, uh, Fox Los Angeles television uh, sports anchor, has uh, been the co-host on this. Uh, we, ironically, she went to Pitt, oh. but she had a brother who played on the 1986 Penn State uh, national championship football team. Wow. She came into this. She came into this story believing that everything she had heard was true, yeah. uh, and so so that's a, a fascinating element to this dynamic. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Well, I know we, we sat here and talked for almost an hour and a half and we didn't even get to half the, half the stuff that, that I listened to or wanted to talk about, which I knew would be the case. That's why you have 19 episodes, right? It's not stretched out. There's just that much stuff to talk about. So make sure you guys check it out with the benefit of hindsight is the podcast framing paterno.com. You can find John on Twitter. Um, and, and he's a great follow. And, and like I said, he, uh, he just, he just brings facts and truth. And that's why that's that's why we linked up. I followed you because I saw something you said. I was like, I agree. And I followed you. And then we, we talked a couple of times. And now here we are 10 years later, bringing the truth about Jerry Sandusky. John, I appreciate you joining me, man. Zach, it's been awesome. Let's do it again. Uh, definitely. Definitely. We will. Thanks.